Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we'll get started here. Thank you so much for joining us for the first seminar of the semester hosted by the Economic Diplomacy Initiative, uh, which seeks to illuminate issues and policy choices at the intersection of economic and national security interests. My name is Aditi Kumar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Belfer Center, by, where I also lead this initiative, along with Nick Burns and Larry Summers. This semester, we will be debating the issues that will be at the top of the next administration's agenda. These include the global competition for digital dominance, the next chapter for US trade policy, and the role of the dollar, and perhaps one day the digital dollar in the global economy. Uh, for those of you interested in tech and digital issues, in addition to today's discussion, we're hosting next week Yan Shui Tong, Dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University, on the evolution of US-China digital and technological competition. The following week, we'll be speaking with the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer of TikTok. Uh, so please stay tuned and sign up for these events. As a reminder, as we kick things off here, please mute yourselves, um, please mute your microphones, but we invite you to keep your video on. We're going to save the second half of this session for audience questions. Um, so please just raise your blue hands and we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question then. Alternatively, you could feel free to chat us your questions at any time during the event and we'll try to get those in. This event is being recorded. Uh, let me introduce now our three guests today, Henry, Abe, and Ali. Thank you so much to all three of you for being here. We're very thrilled to host you and hope that one day we will host you in person as well at the Belfer Center. Henry Farrell is a professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He is also editor in chief of the Monkey Cage blog at the Washington Post. Abe Newman is professor of government at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He is also the director of the Mortara Center for International Studies. The two of them have co-authored co a number of articles, um, as well as a book of Privacy and Power, The Transatlantic Fight Over Freedom and Security, which examines EU-US disputes over privacy and surveillance. Um, they're doing cutting edge work on global networks of goods, ideas, people, and money, and have coined the idea of weaponized interdependence, which we will talk about today. And I just learned that they have a forthcoming edited volume on that topic um, in February of next year. So thank you so much, Abe and Henry. We're so excited to talk to you today. And Ali Wine is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Snowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute. Before that, he was a research assistant at the Belfer Center and will forever be to us a Belferite. So thank you, Ali, for joining us and for graciously agreeing to co-moderate this event with me. Uh, so Ali, I'm going to turn it over to you to get the conversation going. All right, thank you very much, Aditi. And I wish we were doing this in, in person, but uh, thanks to, thanks to te technology, we can at least do this uh, online. So um, Henry and Abe, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really, really excited for this conversation. And I just wanna dive into some of the really, really foundational terminology that you two have introduced into the field of international political economy. So I'll just, I'll say, I'll say a word on these two terms that you've introduced and then would love to have you elaborate on, on those terms. So, so the two terms, you know, Aditi mentioned one of them, weaponized interdependence, and then secondly, this notion of chained globalization. So on the first one, uh, you published an article, a really seminal article, uh, in the summer 2019 issue of International Security, in which you explained that, quote, states increasingly weaponize interdependence by leveraging global networks of informational and financial exchange for strategic advantage. Uh-oh, Ali, I think you are on mute. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, you cut off just in the last five seconds. Oh, okay. Um, and so I was just saying, so you had the term weaponized interdependence, and then at the beginning of this year uh, in foreign affairs, you coined the notion of or the term of chain globalization. And you observed that under chain globalization, states will be bound together by interdependence that will tempt them to strangle their competitors through economic coercion and espionage, even as they try to fight off their rivals' attempts to do the same. So talk us through a little bit sort of the nuts and bolts of these two phenomena. How do they work? How are they playing out? And then maybe if you could put on your sort of speculative hat a little bit, how are these two phenomena evolving differently in the age of COVID-19 than they might have otherwise evolved? Okay, well, I don't know which order we should talk in, but 
The idea behind weaponized interdependence was that we were building on some of the ideas that other people, including Joe Nye, who I see as whistles this evening, have about how interdependents work. And what we really wanted to emphasize in that was the way in which interdependence doesn't just involve relations between uh, individual countries or pairs of countries. Instead, it involves changes to the globalized networks themselves and the ways in which these globalized networks are becoming increasingly centralized. And when those networks become centralized so that there's a single node or a small group of nodes which can be seized upon by a state for a strategic advantage, funny things begin to happen. So we really wanted to capture how this was true and how this wasn't really being understood in the scholarly literature, although very clearly policy practitioners have been thinking about these ideas for a while. So weaponized interdependence is really about understanding how the networks can be weaponized in these kinds of ways. And chain globalization is really an effort to try and figure out how if we are in a world where we are in this situation of interdependence, we have these networks which are built into our economies in ways which are really, really hard to get rid of, how this is going to effectively mean that we are constrained together, and here in particular, the US and China, as the, uh, it was interesting to hear that uh, that the second and third of the uh, series are also going to be devoted to these things. The US and China are tied together, they are stuck together, and they're going to have to try and figure out a modus vivendi, and that is part of what we are trying to uh, argue towards. Of course, the question is, do they reach that modus vivendi, or do they instead find themselves chained together, like those prisoners who used to be uh, executed in uh, Republican France back in the uh, age of the terror, uh, they would be chained together and then drowned and sort of as they struggle with each other to uh, survive. And so I think that there's also a worry and a fear that you could see, uh, you could see increased conflict happening in which, uh, you know, sort of effectively each side can do bad things to the other's economy and that this begins to escalate in some unfortunate ways. And maybe I could just um, elaborate a little bit more, you know, on the, on the idea of weaponized interdependence, we were very, um, taken by the idea that globalization has a structure and that that structure is, uh, it can vary by the network that you're in, that there's not just one globalization or one network uh, in globalization, but that they uh, can take on different topographies and the dominant uh, kind of image of globalization was one where those networks were flat and distributed. And so there was a version, you know, Amory Slaughter kind of has this version of an argument where those networks then distribute power and that they allow for a certain type of politics. And what we were seeing is that in many domains, the economic networks behind information, money, and production have a more hierarchical structure and that that structure uh, created new opportunities for states. So it's the private networks, the companies are building these networks, but that, that when, when they look for efficiency, uh, gains, they often centralize, and that those central nodes then allow states, particularly the United States, to exert power through them. Um, and I think that taking that concept then to the kind of the, the US-China relationship, what we really want to push is the notion that you just can't use this efficiency lens anymore. There, you can't put the genie back in the bottle to where everything's a win-win and we just have to view the world as kind of we can all uh, Ricardi and paradise ourselves uh, into the future, but rather that there will be vulnerabilities. Uh, but I think what we wanted to, you know, to stress with chain globalization is the idea that um, you don't have to just pick a nationalist, retreatist, you know, reshoring strategy, that there is another, you know, a third way out there, which is where you balance vulnerabilities and efficiency uh, to maintain the benefits of globalization as, as, as far as you can, but without uh, un undo security vulnerabilities. So you led exactly where uh, where I wanted to go, and and to talk a little bit more <laughs> to talk a little bit more about uh, sort of how these how these phenomena weaponize interdependence and chain chain globalization, how they inform the U.S. China relationship, how they're shaping the U.S. China relationship, and and the two of you have also written extensively, and I think you were getting at this just now, uh, notions of disentanglement decoupling, and you've talked about uh, this sort of imbalance between the, uh, the, moment, the rhetorical momentum behind decoupling in both Washington and Beijing and sort of the actual sort of operational stickiness. And I was just rereading uh, yet another piece that the two of you wrote for Foreign Affairs a, a few months ago, and I thought you, the two of you articulated or presented a very vivid metaphor that kind of captures 
the difficulties involved in decoupling. And I wonder if maybe the two of you could, could elaborate on that. So uh, you said in this foreign affairs piece a few months ago, quote, uh, that it's wrong to think of China's economy as a discrete organism that can easily be separated from the global economy. Rather, it is a Siamese twin connected by nervous tissue, common organs, and a shared circulatory system. And so talk a little bit more about the difficulties of decoupling or disentanglement in a global context, and then in particular in the US-China context. So you talk about this recalibration of interdependence, balancing vulnerabilities with opportunities. Uh, in what domains do you see disentanglement, decoupling, whatever your sort of preferred term is, in what domains of the US-China relationship do you see that phenomena accelerating or unfolding? And in which domains of the US-China relationship do you think that interdependence is a little bit thicker, it's a little bit stickier, and it's going to be harder to unpack that relationship? Well, speaking broadly, I think if you think about what we're trying to get at with this idea is that people, I think, still tend to think about interdependence as being something which is really just about trade between states. And they don't understand the ways in which economies of the major economies are really so entangled together that it is difficult to disentangle them. We cannot think of the US economy or the Chinese economy anymore as we did 20 or 30 years ago as being discrete things. Instead, they are, they're really, they're denser and more interconnected clusters in this broader global network. And so that means that if you want to uh, cut them off, then you're going to find that all sorts of support systems all sorts of uh, things that you rely on without even thinking about this, that these disappear as well. And I think that this is a particularly worrying problem for US policy at the moment, uh, partly because I think that the current administration, we all, you know, we all know what the current administration's foreign policy stuff is like at the moment, but also partly because I think even in a much smarter administration, we don't have the real understanding of how the different bits and pieces of the economy connect together that we would need in order to be able to set uh, intelligent policy. So I think one of the key priorities that the United States ha has to have over the next five years is dramatically bumping up its understanding of how these economic relationships work. All of these things which they have never really thought about as having uh, strong security implications, and, you know, so supply relations of one sort or another outside of the military uh, procurement zone, which suddenly turn out to be crucially, uh, crucially important. And we need to figure out exactly how this connects together. We need to have you have to continue the surgical metaphor of signing sign these twins we need to have an anatomical map of the world economy that we do not have and what i would say is that as we see where the where the decoupling is happening at the moment is primarily in the tech uh, in the area of tech and here there are two different things happening one is that there is a real fear on the United States part that Huawei is a, a major threat to uh, US international interests. That if you think about this as uh, some cynical European diplomat uh, commented to the economist uh, some weeks ago, that the United States is worried that Huawei will help China to do to the world what the United States was able to do to it uh, in surveillance and in turning the world into this global listening network. So there's a real fear here. And the United States has been uh, on the on the uh, basis of sphere, has been doing everything it can to uh, cut uh, Huawei's knees from under it. But now we're also seeing uh, the United States uh, taking a much broader aim at the uh, Chinese advanced semiconductor sector in general. And that, if it goes ahead, I think is going to really perhaps have some uh, pretty important and pretty dramatic consequences. We'll see how China responds to this. China has been, as far as I can see, relatively uh, relatively uh, quiet in its response up to this point. But if you see China at a point where its crucial national interests are being challenged, of course, China, like every country, is going to start thinking about what the hell it can do to retaliate or to threaten retaliation to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's where we're seeing most decoupling happening. Where we are not seeing decoupling happening, although there have been some mutterings in the Trump administration, is in the financial sector. So that uh, Abe and I have done a lot of work looking at how the uh, United States has used the dollar clearing and its influence over uh, financial messaging in order to cut Iran out of the uh, global financial system. And there has been muttering of doing this with, with China as well. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I think that even the Trump administration may realize that that is an extremely risky proposition because then the interesting question becomes, 
Uh, you could do this to, to Iran because European banks really don't care all that much about Iran. It's a uh, nice source of potential profits, but it's not a major life and death thing. If you threaten European financial institutions' uh, access to China, then that could be a very different thing. And we could actually see uh, a significant move away from the US dominated structures in the global financial system to something different. And that's the kind of thing which is an interesting experiment if you are a scholar of international political economy to watch, but you would pre prefer to be uh, located on Venus or Mars or somewhere else so that you wouldn't necessarily be caught up in any of the unexpected repercussions of this dramatic experiment. Dave, is there anything you want to add to that? I have one more follow-up question, and then I want to turn it over to Aditi to talk more about the policy implications. Sure. So I, mean, I think uh, one thing I'd like to add is just what we hope is that the, um, the weaponized interdependence approach is trying to help policymakers target where are the vulnerabilities the you know the most uh, threatening and so I think there is this kind of you know a Navarro version of we just need to reshore everything bring it all home you know and like mm -hmm. and you basically hear you know business people saying well that's not possible you know we can't do that so then you really need to think, think about well what should we target if we're worried about the geostrategic implications of supply chains and what we're arguing is is that really you need to think about where there are these economic hubs uh, and then how do you diversify, create resilience around those hub positions? And that's, as Henry said, that's why Huawei is so threatening because it's trying to create an alternative hub to formerly Western or US-based um, strategies. Now, what the Trump administration has tried to do is use our own hubs in other economic networks like the Google you know, platform to strangle Huawei. But you could think of another strategy, which is, you know, you get a NATO-based purchasing program, a collective purchasing agreement of an Ericsson, Nokia-based system to create a duopoly in that market. And then, it, you know, it, it weakens the stranglehold that Huawei would have. And I mean, a, another implication is that, you know, everybody, great powers need to be very careful about how they use these hubs because they are very threatening as we are seeing right now in the Huawei situation. It's not just a, you know, a, a game of economic competition over routers. This is, you know, about this uh, deep uh, threat that surveillance power uh, creates for the major power. So I think what we're trying to say is you don't need to throw out globalization. You just need to understand that when you have a hierarchical system where there are these choke points that they then impart particular types of influence and your response is when those things are being activated or threatened or there's a change in the, in the system between the great powers on those uh, areas. The other thing, I just wanna echo what Henry was saying about um, needing more knowledge within the decision-making, the policy sphere around how supply chains work and where we can you know, go in and try to separate the Siamese twins. Because if we don't, we're likely to have uh, you know, cases of escalation or miscalculation where we, you know, we do something and we don't really understand the consequences of that. Um, and we, we saw that, for example, in the Rusal sanctions, where we, you know, we went over, at, you know, at Rusal and we didn't anticipate, you know, this is aluminum, it's a commodity, who cares about this thing, you know, but then it turns out that they have an affiliate that makes a very particular type of, you know, high grade aluminum mm -hmm. that basically all luxury cars require and it's, it's very hard to source it from somebody else. And all of a sudden, we're going to shut down the entire European car, you know, market through this sanction against a, a Russian oligarch, basically. So those kinds of things, I think, is why it's boring, maybe. It seems technocratic, you know, how do supply chains work? But we really need to partner with our colleagues in business schools and learn about the, the, the fine nitty gritty of these things so that when we create policy, it doesn't set off a chain reaction. So, so you and Henry both are saying the United States, as it's recalibrating interdependence with China, as it's thinking about weaponized interdependence, it needs to tread carefully, obviously need for smart policy. And Aditi, help us, help us think through that. Thanks, Ali. And uh, while I am going to ask two or three more questions, I do encourage members of the audience to think of theirs and please start raising your hand and we will go to you in about 10 or 15 minutes. So speaking of, of the policy angle, Abe and Henry, the U.S. government has taken a number of defensive steps to protect sensitive markets from foreign exploitation. These include expanding the role of the Committee on Foreign Investments in the U.S. CFIUS, 
which screens and sometimes blocks foreign investments and right now is in the news because it's involved in the partial divestiture of TikTok. Also the Commerce Department's entity list, which prohibits the transfer of exports of US items to certain blacklisted firms, including Huawei. How would you grade these defensive efforts in terms of their efficacy in protecting US national security interests and also US economic interests over the longer term? Henry, are you signaling me to go first? I'll go first. Uh, yeah, well, I have something I can say, but if you want. Uh, no, no, that's fine. I think I would just start, which is that, um, you know, there has been a lot of um, consternation, I would say, around, you know, oh, how can we do this? We're, we're, we're messing in the free market and, you know, like what's going on here? And I think um, Henry and I, our, our overall, you know, all takeaway is like, we have to rebalance security and efficiency concerns. And so we have to start thinking about how economic issues are national security issues in certain domains. And then we have to be judicious with how we do that so that not, we don't, you know, everything doesn't be become this national security exemption. But, um, you know, I just taught Hamilton in my class last week. And, you know, this isn't a new thing. This is an ongoing conversation. We should be totally fine to say that we need to think about our national security uh, concerns in economic domains. Um, I also think, you know, the Chinese government, they know this and they've been doing this for years. You know, people have always said, oh, how dare you have these rules about coming into the Chinese market? They're just they're just playing a sensible game where you need to be concerned about national security. And so I think instead of like trying to, let's say, ram the neoliberal, uh, you know, uh, bell all the time, we should be honest with this. On the flip side, I think what Henry and I have been arguing in our more policy focused pieces is that you really need to have a, uh, a rules-based, expert-based usage of these policies so that they are used in a way that's credible and sends a signal to our adversaries that this is being done in a legitimate and responsible way that's not arbitrary. Because once you get into a kind of an arbitrary set of policies, then your adversaries, well, they'll just start doing that too. And it, it can lead to a quick kind of escalation um, for a tit for tat kind of beggar thy neighbor type policy in this domain. And so um, Henry and I have been arguing that you really need to uh, put forward the experts to have a, a you know, rules-based process and that decision-making that's transparent and is also accountable. And I think most people felt like the CFIUS process, for example, was all of those things. It was a highly regarded process. Um, and I think what you're seeing right now is that that's being degraded, at least in my view. And the TikTok decision, I think, is a great example of this, where it's, it's just not be, it, it's a completely fine policy strategy to say that we need to be careful of Chinese platform companies, but the way it's being done is opening a door to undermine that process. And if, if you've been following, this is the nitty gritty, but the recent court decision where it's opening up this kind of uh, set of challenges to these national security moves. You know, courts don't wanna do that. They've almost always given blanket kind of uh, power to the, to the executive to do these types of things. And what you're seeing right now is courts are saying, wait a minute, this isn't following due process. You know, you're, you're, you're off base here. And that really weakens our entire national security response when you start to do these kinds of arbitrary uh, or not well thought out individual actions. Uh, just to build on that, uh, because I, you know, not surprisingly, we think along the same lines here. Uh, the uh, the Achilles heel of the U.S. strategy is U.S. courts and uh, the uh, deference that uh, U.S. courts have traditionally given to uh, the U.S. government, especially when the U.S. government invokes a national security rationale. And so the question then becomes. If you begin to see, as you've seen with TikTok, as you've seen with the uh, preliminary stuff happening with, uh, with WeChat, and perhaps even more importantly, and much less publicly, a case that Exxon took successfully against OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, where it uh, effectively won a judgment saying that OFAC had been, uh, had been somewhat arbitrary in, its, uh, in the way that it you know, decided and sort of uh, ex post on sanctions against Exxon, you're seeing uh, the beginning beginnings of a counterattack using the court system against the arbitrary use by the United States of these powers to pursue national security objectives. 
And this is uh, likely especially a problem in the Trump administration for, uh, you know, because the Trump administration isn't particularly good at this kind of stuff, uh, is not particularly good at figuring out justifications, also tends to swing wildly from, uh, you know, sort of treating these things as bargaining chips or treating them as essential parts of the uh, international legal infrastructure. You saw that uh, with, you know, a lot of suggestions, for example, that Trump would be prepared to uh, swap uh, sanctions against Huawei at a certain point for a concessions in trade. And you saw a similar thing happen with ZTE. The more that the United States undermines its ability to uh, do the stuff legally, the more difficulty it's going to find itself in over the longer run, because you know, a lot of this stuff is based upon the discretion of agencies to behave in a more or less untrammeled way, in that, especially in national security cases. And the more that the courts begin to get pulled in and decide they actually don't like what's happening, the uh, less able the United States will be to terrify the hell out of foreign banks and foreign businesses to get them to comply with its edicts. Thank you. So that's on the defensive side. What do you think we should be doing on the offensive side? So Abe, you mentioned a, maybe a NATO-led effort in the 5G space. Do you think that the U.S. needs an industrial policy to build up our own capabilities? You know, on the offensive side, what, what Henry and I have been advocating for is that um, that we really, as policymakers and also as academics, that we need to start thinking about um, what are the rules of the road for these types of tools? You know, when can we use these legitimately and when do we need to restrain ourselves from using them? Um, in one of our pieces, we kind of liken it to uh, the moment when nuclear weapons, you know, emerge on the scene that, you know, people didn't know how to manage that. You had to come up with language like uh, mutually assured destruction. You know, that wasn't just there when those tools came about. We had to kind of invent that type of um, kind of norms, principles, and, and structure. And so we're arguing that, you know, that we're in a similar moment right now where the international economy is being turned into a geostrategic weapon. And you know, it's easy to see them as just these amazing things. And I think if you, if you talk to the Treasury Department right now, they'll say, well, there's no risk. You know, this, we can just do this as much as we want. We can go on the offense and there's just no alternative to the dollar. And I think what, what we would say is that, you know, that kind of hubris, first of all, it's not true across all networks. If you look at Huawei and in information technology, you're seeing that that could easily be turned against us in a, in a quick minute. Uh, but also even in the dollar area, it's, it's not just confined to using these networks our allies, our adversaries, they can have asymmetric responses to the use of these weaponized interdependence tools. And so we just need to come up with a better a set of, of norms and rules that we will use in order to, to signal to other people of like, yes, we are very powerful in these domains, but um, we're willing to constrain ourselves. So what this means, we're going to need to bundle a number of policies together. It's very clear that people are beginning to talk about this in the context perhaps of a Biden administration, which would be certainly more open to working in a multilateral way than its predecessors have been. But you need, first of all, as you say, uh, Aditi, you need a industrial policy among advanced industrialized democracies, as Abe has already said, in order to try and pull this together. Secondly, you need shared regulatory structures much deeper and much more intense forms of information sharing among advanced industrialized democracies to defend against some of these problems, and especially the attacks which uh, potentially had the uh, possibility of uh, weakening democracy. And there was an interesting piece in the MIT Technology Review, and I will butcher her name, by uh, Maricha Shaka, which came out a couple of days ago, which proposes this. But the third part, which is going to be really, really tough, I think, for the United States is that if it wants to get Europe to buy onto this stuff, it's going to have to start thinking about ways in which it provides rights to uh, the citizens of other democracy, uh, democracies against US surveillance. This is something that the US has been ferociously resistant to, but it's very, very clear that uh, the European Union is going to be simply incapable of engaging in these deep forms of cooperation with the United States, which is necessary if you want to create a really 
uh, bound together troubled democracies. It would be impossible for the European Union to do this legally, given how its equivalent of the Supreme Court has been ruling. If the United States does not agree to integrate its surveillance, uh, you know, surveillance structures into a broader set of controls, not only to protect US citizens, but the citizens of other democracies as well. And that's a debate that I think has, has not even begun yet, but that's going to be a very, very difficult and interesting debate. Okay, thank you to both of you. Let me get a few questions from the audience here and then maybe Ali, if you have more, I'll circle back to you. Uh, so let me start here with Hamish Falconer, your first up, and then I've got Joe Nye after that. Hamish, go ahead. Thanks, Aditi. I'm Hamish Faulkner. I'm a Yale World Fellow and former British diplomat. I wanted to uh, expand a bit on uh, Henry's comments about the rest of the world. It can certainly feel from the UK a bit like uh, US policy is seeking to export CFIUS to other countries. There's been concern about uh, Britain's emerging technology industrial bases, vulnerability to Chinese investment. And there's quite a lot of American pressure on the UK to seek to uh, be more interventionist in our own economy, which is quite interesting in an emerging tech uh, context. I wondered if you could say any more uh, about whether or not you think uh, moving towards a more sort of, I guess, Western sphere approach to emerging technology is possible in the short term and what that might mean for American diplomacy in this area. Thank you. I think it's certainly possible. I think it, Britain is going to be one very interesting case in point because uh, you have a push, obviously, in Brexit to move away from many of these structures and an enormous fight which is about to get going between the United Kingdom and the European Union over data protection and privacy issues and uh, GCHQ. So that's going to be an extremely unpleasant battle that is ahead of us. What I would say is that, uh, is that these things, you know, it's pretty clear that uh, democracies are beginning to figure out that they need to work together. It's extremely difficult for them to do so precisely because so many of the uh, key functions that they want to, uh, that they want to protect against uh, potential outside interference and attack, that these are not just, uh, these are job, not just technical systems. These are sometimes systems which are deeply integrated, not only into the economy, but in politics as well. So uh, this is going to keep diplomats busy, I think, for a number of years. So I, I, I think that there's a clear need. There is, are clearly mutterings beginning to happen. People are beginning to talk about talks about these things, but uh, building building in the really substantial ways, which you would have to do in order to make this uh, make this work. I mean, you know, so this is this is as Abe said, it is like the moment you know, it's like the Cold War, or maybe even better after World War II, the realization that you have to start to construct a new kind of international order, and uh, in order to try and protect the uh, domestic systems that uh, you want to protect, and that this is going to take some very difficult and some very uncomfortable political steps if it's to work. And I, I would just add that I think that you see across most of our European allies, you see that there are these factions within them where there is a conflict about the economic need to engage with China on a whole host of economic issues. And then there's a faction that's very worried about the security concerns of doing that. And so the case that I'm most familiar with is Germany, where you basically see the chancellery and the foreign ministry are in an open war with each other about which position should be the dominant position. And what I just think is uh, very tragic is that we've just spent the last three years um, not really uh, helping our European allies kind of come to a solution that would be in our favor. Instead, we are viewed, I think, universally across Europe as um, arrogant, annoying, you know, it's, it's all sticks, no carrots. It's this kind of, you know, um, brash, like we're going to sanction you until you can't sanction somebody no more, you know, and um, it's really, it's, it's unfortunate because there is fertile ground for, I think, in most of the countries that there is groups that are interested in a cooperative solution that would come and think about how do we create a secure and effective global technology structure that privileges uh, our interests, our security interests, but also allows economic, um, you know, kind of globalization and integration to continue. And so I'm hoping um, that if we went to a Biden administration that we could pursue that and that we could um, try to kind of steer that a little bit more elegantly. Joe Nye. 
Well, I agree with what Ali said about the importance and originality of the work that Henry and, and Abe have done. Um, but I'm interested to ask him a question of drawing out of how things have changed on weaponization of interdependence. Um, and in particular, uh, I mean, because we weaponization of interdependence is not new. Albert Hirschman wrote about it before Bob Cohen and I wrote about it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not new behavior, but what's interesting is the forms that it takes as the economy, the world global economy evolves. Um, when I think that the important point is to realize it's a multi-party game. And this discussion about US and China has been very much focused on state to state and not enough on the role of companies. And what I want to ask about is how that's going to play in the next uh, round um, when Bob and I did a, a look at the oil crisis of, of 1973, which was a great case of weaponization of interdependence, what was interesting is that Saudi Arabia um, and the other OPEC countries wanted to, they, their oil embargo was 25% uh, against the US and the Netherlands because we were the most uh, supportive of Israel. And this grew out of the Yom Kippur War. What was interesting in retrospect is it turned out that all countries lost the same amount of oil. So while it was officially 25%, some, it, everybody lost about 12%. And what happened is the companies, the seven sisters, so to speak, uh, um, basically equilibrated the loss of oil so that nobody suffered too much. And you say, well, why were they doing this? And they were doing it out of their own self-interest. But they were an extremely, an extremely important uh, third party to the game, or actually seven extra parties to the game. And uh, in the same way, if we look at the current questions about interdependence in technology and its weaponization, uh, it was conventional wisdom a few years ago that because Google and Facebook uh, were American based, they were enormous influences, uh, uh, instruments of American influence. In fact, in 2016, the Russians turned Facebook around and made it a major way for them to influence the host country, the US. And subsequently, we've been, the government of the US and private groups have been trying to put pressure on Facebook to improve its game and to. Uh, uh, control what's, uh, uh, what it takes down and how it takes it down and so forth. Uh, but there's a lot of dispute about this. And so the question I want to ask is, are we going to see um, a much greater role of the government regulation of industry in places like Western democracies? We already see pressure for localization parts of the cloud uh, because of wanting data localization, even in Europe and many other countries. So is this going to, is this new version of the weaponization of interdependence that we're seeing in the digital area gonna lead to a much greater role of government regulation of industry or companies? And if not, what's that do to the interstate competition where the Chinese government will have party control over apparently private enterprises, but the US government may not have. So I, I wanted to draw you out on the sort of these, the, the, making it a three party game, not just a two party game. And this is just, just this is a, these are fantastic questions. And you've, uh, you've hit upon what I think is uh, one of the weak spots of the original way in which we framed uh, weaponized interdependence, which is that we treated private actors effectively as if they were ventriloquist dummies in which states would say X and they would do, they would say X as well. Our states would say jump and they would ask how high. And very clearly that is not the case in the real world. And so the uh, book that uh, was mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, which is coming out with Dan Dresner, uh, The Uses and Abuses of Weaponized Interdependence, one of the things where uh, a couple of our colleagues take wallops at us is exactly the, uh, on this set of questions and the need to start thinking in a much more systematic way about how states and private actors interact. So we do also have a piece which is forthcoming in the 75th anniversary issue 
issue of international organization where we talk uh, just to the point that you raised about platform companies. And here in a sense, I think Abe and I were actually not, we're not proceeding there from our work in weaponized interdependence, but from other work that we've done, which tries to build in many ways on the work that you and Bob were doing back in the 1970s, thinking about how it is that interdependence doesn't just have consequences for states, but also has consequences for private actors, provides them with opportunities and provides opportunities to work across different, uh, you know, different national systems in a way that wasn't uh, previously, be, previously possible. So we talk about the platform companies and how platform companies effectively got used in this kind of way that the United States effectively built a, it built an international communications regime, which was based upon the principle of, of self-regulation, not recognizing that self-regulation basically tied its hands behind its back in many ways and gave opportunities and advantages to others to, uh, you know, to, to then build stuff within this self-regulatory system, which could be turned against US interests. And it's also, it's, it's clear we're in a moment of political change at the moment. You know, you have both of the candidates for the United States president, both of them are talking about how much they dislike social media. They've got very different reasons for disliking social media, but they, uh, but you see uh, Biden talking about how it is that he wants to uh, get rid of section 230 perhaps, this, uh, which is the cornerstone, uh, this is the part of the Communication Decency Act, which is the cornerstone for this entire self-regulatory system. I think it's going to be very, very hard to do that. But what I think our aim and I, what I think our arguments would lead us to think is that you might see a kind of a tacit modus vivendi where the United States isn't able to do as much as it would like to regulate these companies itself, uh, but is prepared to give greater leeway to the European Union to regulate these companies through the back door and the presumption that some of the standards that the European Union forces them to uh, adhere to are also going to uh, be a tacit means of solving some problems for the United States as well. If that works out that way, of course, you would have the usual messiness, uh, protectionism and fears about protectionism and fights going on, but you also might see a, a greater task of willingness, okay, we can't get this stuff through our system, so maybe uh, if the Europeans want to introduce content regulation of one sort or another that can help us push back against some of these abuses of these uh, systems by other countries and other actors, that this might be something that the United States is prepared to live with in a way which it might not have been under the in the days, say, for example, of Ira Magaziner and his successors uh, who were devoted to a very different uh, vision of how the internet would work. That's fascinating, and I, I really look forward to the next article and book. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, I wanted to add just a distinction that we also try to make in this um, edited volume that Henry mentioned about that there's this overarching category of economic statecraft. And within that realm of economic statecraft, you get a lot of different tools. And so there we try to distinguish between, you know, what is weaponized interdependence as opposed to um, asymmetric interdependence or what I would maybe call market power, you know, trying to use the traditional versions of you don't get access to my market or we're going to put a blo blockade on you. Uh, those types of stories, th there's a, a lot of those that have happened and you've worked uh, extensively in those. I think the thing that Henry and I want to underscore is that globalization creates these basic infrastructures uh, that are network-based and that those network-based infrastructures that they themselves become a channel of power. And so it's not just the goods that are going across borders, but it's about these conduits. And so something like the SWIFT system, you know, it, it becomes a way for states to exert coercion that, that's not really related to the markets themselves. And one of the things that becomes powerful of that is that once you control them, you don't have to hurt yourself to hurt others. So in a traditional market power story or market access, you would say, you know, we're going to deny ourselves goods from China because we want to put pressure on China. We don't want to give them access to this. But in, the, in, in this weaponized interdependence story, the private actors that are being abused are usually third parties. You know, it's Deutsche Bank that has to enforce secondary sanctions that the United States is imposing. It's not hurting US companies. We're actually just fine. But it's then, you know, these foreign companies through these network infrastructures are becoming the conduit and the channel. And I think just like you said, we need to explore when can they push back? When can't they push back? Um, if you take the example of um, uh, Apple and, and terrorism, you know, in the post 
9-11 moment, it was very difficult for technology companies who sat on these kinds of core choke points to resist US government pressure because it was just not, you know, the scandal would be too big. But then you have the San Bernardino attacks, you know, many years later, and those companies are saying, we're not gonna cooperate. We're not gonna give you this access to our choke points. And so that I think is, shows you that private actors can respond and that, that it is about, I, I would say, the legitimacy of the target and that we need more research about how that plays out and, and when can they do that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to emphasize in your second point about the regulation of industry, uh, for me, our regulatory institutions and expertise are a national security capacity. And the degradation of those expert regulatory bodies weakens our ability to leverage these tools globally. And so it's not, you know, the FDA, NOAA, the, um, the FAA, you might not think of those as international actors, but for, you know, decades, we were the crown jewel, the gold standard of uh, regulatory based expertise. And I think as we degrade those institutions, we weaken our ability to set a standard that can be a global standard, and we therefore undermine our ability to compete in this world of weaponized interdependence. Good. Daniel Sofio. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Sofio. Um, I currently work in the private sector as a ventriloquist dummy um, at, a, uh, at a data science company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, formerly with CSIS uh, in DC, where I worked on um, sort of Chinese economic statecraft, a little bit around sort of um, some tech transfer export control stuff. So thank you everybody uh, for all the participants so far. This has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, I just sort of had kind of two quick related questions. So the first one is on export controls in particular um, and sort of thinking about like ACRA from a couple of years ago and sort of maybe how, how sort of the use or misuse of export controls, um, you know, perhaps in the last couple of years compares with, um, you know, things more on the investment screening side like CFIUS um, you know, as well as I know we've been sort of waiting all year for the alleged foundational technologies um, to sort of list to be released by BIS. I think we got a foundational technology in January. Um, you know, I'd really like to get a full set. Um, and then I think the second question I had is sort of on Chinese learning in this space. So particularly, um, you know, actually in the context of export controls, um, both with uh, sort of ByteDance and TikTok, right, we've seen this kind of export controls with Chinese characteristics where suddenly these things come up and there is some you know, some lawfare aspect or angle now that maybe was not a part of the conversation before. I mean, it's also quite possible I'm out of date on the subject. Um, so I think I'd be very interested in hearing about that. And then maybe also as that might pertain to something like kind of the, the pending NVIDIA ARM um, acquisition, right, from I think 13 September. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm, Henry and I are probably uh, both dancing around this question because I would say there is so little academic work about export controls. I mean, it is like there's some you know, legal scholarship, but in the political science realm, um, there's very little. Uh, George Shambaugh wrote a really interesting book in the 90s on this topic. But aside from that, uh, you know, I, I could name just a very few other articles that re really get into the politics of export controls. Um, I think Henry and I are both, we're digging into this and it's one of our kind of list of things that uh, are important. Um, our general, I think, argument is that the key behind them is the, the, the structure, the hierarchy of the supply chains and where then export controls really have bite or where they're, they're not. And so there's many examples from kind of um, a supercomputer technology where it didn't work, you know, in the past where these things were ineffective because they we really didn't have control over the key levers in the supply chains to to prevent these things from happening and i think the chinese learning in these you know they're trying they're creating their own entities list they're you know they're doing these kind of uh, mimicry techniques in order to say you know we can play these games too but at least as henry and i have observed most of these they don't have um, a key choke point to use in the you know, export controls. And so it really, they have to fall back to market access where they're just saying, you know, you won't have market access to our market. But in many cases, we have the key inputs that their companies need in order to make the next generation product. So if you look at semiconductors, uh, semiconductors if they went through with some of their threats, it would only hurt Huawei ultimately uh, you know, in this situation. And I think the um, NVIDIA ARM merger is a great example of how 
China is really neutered in this situation, you know, that they can't, it, it's, it's un, there's no plausible strategy where they can stop it. And it's really going to eliminate their ability to catch up in the semiconductor um, innovation chain. And so it's an example that Henry and I would say, like, that's very threatening, that merger. And, you know, like, I'm sure the Trump administration is very behind it, but we should dance very lightly behind it because it really basically says that the Chinese will not be able to catch up in, you know, semiconductor innovation. And, and the key to it will be owned by a U.S. company. So I think um, seeing, putting a weaponized interdependence frame then tells you how kind of these things that we thought were just economic interests quickly become uh, geostrategic concerns. The other thing that I think is, uh, again, very, very poorly understood, except by lawyers and even there, they, they tend not to think in these kinds of ways, is the relationship between national security and the global intellectual property regime. Because uh, very clearly, the more that uh, China sees itself being uh, hampered by global IP to the extent that uh, you know, the United States is using rules about uh, you have X percent of uh, IP uh, from US sources, therefore you are expected to, uh, to, to adhere to our rules and uh, not to uh, export this, that, or the other actor. Uh, the more that China sees itself as being hampered by this, the less that it has to gain from uh, respect of global intellectual property and the more that it may want to uh, try and uh, remake the rules to some extent in its favor. And here, uh, I would love to see more. And again, you see uh, commentary on this, but you don't see any real, uh, you don't see any real in-depth research, or at least not that I've seen in the uh, public space, about the ways in which uh, you know, some Chinese embeddedness into various uh, global, various global uh, institutions and organizations can help them to uh, shape the agenda away from the U.S. and uh, shape standards, shape, 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 shape uh, aspects of the international economy. Uh, the nuts and bolts in ways that help them to push their model rather than the U.S. model. So, I, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's a very very messy and complicated set of questions. Uh, I think we would we would defer to the experts on export controls with regard to the specifics because uh, we are not those experts. Yes, we are international relations scholars who are looking at a different set of issues. Uh, but from our understanding of this, it's uh, you know, the, the politics, as, as Abe said, it is going to be hard. On the one hand, you have this politics where China is incapable of really embedding its, uh, its uh, efforts to control uh, ex export of information onto global structures in the way that the United States is able to do. On the other hand, the United States, the more that it tries to turn these global structures into crude instruments of power, uh, the more likely it is that not, not only China, but other states will uh, look to escape from the grip and try to uh, create alternative ways of doing things. Lev. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lev. I recently uh, completed the uh, Regional Studies East Asia Master's Program at Harvard. I wrote my thesis on, um, excuse me, I wrote my thesis on the CCP strategies for incentivizing self-censorship, which it turns out uh, work uh, both towards uh, citizens of the It's okay, Lev, we've all been there. Maybe I'll come back to you, Lev, in a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for the dog to settle down, let me, let me ask another question, which comes by way of Vashishta Doshi, Doshi, who's a PhD student at UC Santa Barbara studying economic statecraft of middle powers. And her question is, in the US-China world of weaponized interdependence, uh, how can middle powers like India gain some modicum of economic and national security autonomy from the superpowers? Short answer to that question is uh, buy uh, the copy of uh, your copy of the use of the use of weaponized interdependence when it comes out and read uh, Amrita Narlikar's uh, contribution, which is exactly on this uh, on this point. And uh, she does uh, suggest, you know, so she clearly, she clearly, she talks about the uh, difficulties that uh, middle powers have 
in this world is where the uh, elephants are roaring at each other, that this is something where, uh, where middle powers are going to have some difficulty, but uh, where they do have some scope for autonomy. And you do see uh, versions of this, of course, with regard to middle powers. So you can think about the uh, recent kerfuffle between Japan and South Korea, where uh, Japan didn't like the way that South Korean court rulings on, uh, on its uh, abuse of South Korean women during World War II were going. And so it responded by effectively threatening the South Korean electronics industry's access to certain key chemicals that it needed to, uh, that it needed to work. So, they, so, so uh, you're getting the replication of this with respect, back, with respect to middle powers working against other middle powers or smaller powers. They are replicating some of these dynamics and they are thinking about ways in which they can become more sophisticated in uh, resisting the pressure from larger countries such as the uh, United States uh, and uh, you know, what leverage they can find from uh, struggles between the US and other countries. Okay, Lev, should we try it again? Yes, thank you very much. I apologize for that. Um, so this, this question is for uh, Professor Farrell. I actually wanted to ask about a paper that you co-wrote with Bruce Schneier uh, about two years ago about common knowledge attacks on democracy. And uh, in just generally speaking in that paper, you and uh, Professor Schneier made the assertion that uh, we lack uh, as academics uh, a rigorous framework for modeling the different types of information borne attacks uh, on democratic systems. Um, so, don't, don't worry. I just, we can hear you. We can hear this you. Is okay. not the top okay. 10 of uh, difficulties I've seen on um, Zoom over the last six months. I really appreciate that. So, uh, my, my own um, uh, research is on the CCP's strategies for causing citizens to self-censor, which they do through a variety of mechanisms. Inside the PRC, the CCP has very powerful tools in the Great Firewall, et cetera, but they also use a variety of agents, both corporate agents and also citizens against each other. Outside the PRC, the CCP can't really use the firewall, but it can still use economic power in order to incentivize global actors to choose not to speak up in the first place. So, Given that the context of this conversation is economic decoupling, and given that we still don't really have a strong framework for evaluating the impact of influence operations or information operations coming from adversaries, if we do undergo a, a chaotic, you know, like a, a ripping uh, yeah. decoupling with China, how does that alter the, the threat or the attack surface in terms of common knowledge attacks on our democracy and on our potential allies' democracy? That's a really good and really tough question because it's uh, asking me to put together two very different lines of research that I haven't thought systematically enough about in relation to each other. And where I would also, you know, Bruce, I don't know if you have had the opportunity to meet him. He is around, uh, yeah, uh, you know, Bruce is a uh, terrifyingly intelligent person to work on these issues with. So, uh, but I guess what I would say is that, you know, if you think about the kinds of external external pressures that are happening. Here you can think about the ways in which, for example, it was the National Basketball Association, the way it, you know, sort of the uh, way in which China managed to successfully to terrify the NBA into doing stuff. You can think about the ways in which uh, China, you know, in which uh, Hollywood is looking to uh, play to the uh, Chinese market by, for example, removing that uh, patch from uh, the uh, Top Gun sequel, uh, which is, so there are lots and lots of ways in which that is true. Now, the, the, the problem for China is, uh, and this is something that Abe actually, you know, this is something that Abe talked about already, is that China, in order to uh, pursue these kinds of strategies, it pursues these strategies through cutting off market access of one sort or another. So the implicit threat is that if you allow this stuff to happen, you're suddenly going to find that several hundred million consumers are not going to have access to your product anymore. And that's something which can be a pretty terrifying threat 
if you are a business, but if you keep on doing it, you are cutting off your own nose to spite your face because there are going to be several hundred uh, million angry NBA fans in China who are going to say, hey, what the hell has happened to our entertainment? Uh, there are going to be, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, there, are, uh, there are lots of ways in which you are damaging your economy. And as you move away from soft sectors such as entertainment into more substantial sectors, you begin to see the limits of the threat. So you see, for example, with Australia, China has been threatening, uh, threatened that it will block the movement of uh, Chinese students to Australian universities in order to retaliate against uh, things that Australia has done. Uh, China has said nothing about uh, access to Australian uh, minerals because, of course, that is something which is essential for the Chinese economy. So I think that uh, the, the limits to that strategy are clear. And if we find ourselves in a world where there is more decoupling happening already, the ability of China to uh, censor will inevitably diminish precisely because those markets themselves on which it relies are going to diminish. And so we will see those uh, opportunities for external self-censorship uh, beginning to uh, uh, not evaporate, but becoming substantially smaller than they are at the moment. How that fits into the uh, question of common knowledge that uh, Bruce and I have been thinking about and that we are hoping to uh, revive again. Uh, we're hoping to do a much bigger, more comprehensive paper to uh, develop these ideas. That's something which I haven't even begun to think about. And so I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. I don't think you disappointed him at all, Henry. Uh, thank you so much. I think we're right at time. Thank you all for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. Ali, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me. And to Abe and Henry, uh, this was a phenomenal session. Thank you for laying out all of your arguments. I think we're all looking forward to the book coming out in February. So everybody, please go get that. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Please join us, as I said, next Friday. Yan Shui Tong, and the following Thursday, same time, the CISO of TikTok. Thank you all. Thanks, Aditi. Thanks, Ali. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you.